Okay, um, welcome Millennium Fellows to our first webinar session. We're excited to have you all today. My name is Onutu Jarona. And my name is Obia Sunday. And we are both from the University of Ibadan in Nigeria. Today we have a special guest joining us. Uh, his name is Adeshida. All right, so um, the webinar will be, will be for one hour. For the first half of an hour, we will um, hear from our speakers. The second half, can, can you hear me? Okay, the second half of the hour, we will spend um, asking questions, that's Q's and A's. So if you have any question, uh, please submit them in the chat box below, and we'll get, them, um, we'll get to them in the Q&A question part. Okay, just like you said, hey, um, joining us today is uh, Baba Tomiwa Adeshida. I uh, will first of all, I will go quickly go through uh, Baba Tomiwa Adeshida's profile very briefly. Uh, Tomiwa is a private sector and a philanthropy engagement consultant for the Sustainable Development Goals Fund, SDG Funds, the United Nations mechanism based in New York, that brings together United Nations agencies, national governments, academia, civil society, and business to achieve SDGs. His primary role is to engage the private sector to establish sustainable partnership with the United Nations through the SDG Fund in numerous countries around the world. Tomiwa's passion is rooted in social reconstruction, particularly in developing nations. He plays a critical role in promoting the welfare of the underprivileged in the society through partnership with various organizations and like-minded individuals. He has been nominated and also received several corporate social responsibility, also known as CSR awards, some of which include the Future Awards Nigeria, the Nigeria CSR Awards, and the 100 most impactful CSR leaders global listing in India. With that, we ask that you give your full attention to Tomiwa and help us in welcoming him by typing down in the chat box or simply waving. So uh, Tomiwa, over to you. Oh, sorry. Can you hear me now? Yeah. Okay, good. Thank you, both of you. I, I thought you were going to murder my name. I'll have killed you. I like Nigeria <laughs> murder my name. So I know you did a good job. Thank you very much. And it's a pleasure to be here and to, you know, see everyone, meet everyone, be it uh, over the, over the uh, using technology, you know, and that's one of the things that technology is doing for us right now. We can sit down in various parts of the world, in our offices, in our schools, in our homes, and you know, communicate like this. So it's a pleasure to meet everyone. Now, I'd like to thank MCN and United Nations Academic Impact for launching the Millennium Fellowship. As far as I'm concerned, this is such a very laudable initiative that will produce the next generation of world-class leaders and world influencers. And I really mean that. I'm not just saying it out of what people say generally. I'd also like to thank my very good friend, Sam, for the privilege to be able to engage all of you today. You know, I congratulate him for the work well done and MCN in general for all the good work that, you know, the organization has been doing. Be able to be able to get this partnership with the United Nations Academic Impact is not, it's no joke. It's a very big milestone in the life of the organization. And I expect that all the fellows, you know, take it very seriously because, you know, this, this platform will open huge opportunities for each and every one of you as long as you take advantage of them very well. Can everyone hear me properly? Yes, please. Okay, that's good. Okay, uh, so I follow the progress of Millennium Fellows and I can confidently say that you are a generation of leaders who are more ethical, collaborative, capable and committed in all the things that you have been doing. And in a sector that is more oftentimes operating silos, there's no better way to achieve the goals, the SDG goals, you know, by other than through commitment. Collaboration is extremely meaningful and signals an understanding that no single individual organization, corporation, company or country can achieve the goals on their own. It takes intentional communication and collaboration with other organizations and like-minded individuals. And so I'm here, I'm happy to engage with each and every one of you. I'm excited because I know that you're all highly intelligent people, you know, with different backgrounds, understanding, fields of study and whatnot. So I'm, I'm happy to talk to you, but also hear from you and engage with you. And most importantly, keep in touch with you after this webinar, you know, so that we can rub off each other positively. Thank you very much. So um, I believe the moderators will, will ask questions or am I expected to just, you know, go with the flow? Hi, moderators. 
Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, we can hear you. So, um, would you ask the questions or shall I just... You actually have uh, uh, 15 more minutes to speak before we go into questions. Question and answers. Okay, so I can just... Because I have a list of questions. Okay, yeah. So, all right then. Um, so, I was given like a few pointers on what to talk about and it's been very helpful. So, yeah, I'll just go through the pointers and then you know, we'll get to the question and answer session. So the first thing was, what motivates me to work in the social impact sector? So I have, I've worked, my, I have a career of over 15 years right now, and all my years of experience has been in the social impact sector. And for me, is the opportunities, the tremendous opportunities that exist to impact people, to impact lives practically. That's what drives me, you know, to be active in the social impact sector. Um, as you can tell from my name and everything, I'm African. I'm Nigerian, born and bred. Yeah, I'm in New York now, but my roots are still strongly in Africa and in Nigeria and in any part of the world, you know, that needs help, you know, towards achieving the goals and whatnot. But one thing that I'm tired of hearing about as an African is the fact that Africa is a continent with potentials. We've been hearing this. This has been said from long before we were born. Our generation was born. It has been said all through. And if we're not careful, it will continue to be said until, you know, we leave the earth. And when you say a nation or a, or a continent or someone has potentials, it means that there are things that are inherent in that person or in that nation that even not properly unleashed will just die with the person or with the nation. And we're tired of hearing this. I, as an individual, I'm tired of hearing this. Where Africa is a continent that has over a billion young people. And a billion young people is a lot. You know, you can imagine if, there are a billion young people with no proper education, no proper health care, or nothing, or no jobs. That's a nation, that's a recipe for disaster. That's like a ticking time bomb that is just waiting to explode. Because a billion young people that are not educated or are not equipped to the right skills to earn a living or a decent living for themselves will ultimately go into crime. As they say, the idle hands is the devil's workshop. So for me, I'm passionate about working with young people to change the stereotypes of not just young Africans, but young people across the world. Because what you have more often than not is the fact that the older generation keeps saying the younger generation, which is our generation, is not ready for leadership. And so that could be two sides, two sides to that coin. It either means they are not leading the right way or they are leading the right way and our younger generation is not, is not ready to be led. And if you look at most of the people that are in positions of authority today, particularly in a continent like Africa, they started running the show when they were in their late 20s to early 30s. And I reckon most of you are in your 20s right now. And so what was, why, is, why are things like this? Why can't we be in the position of authority? So for me, I'm passionate about working with young people so that we can change the stereotype that we're not ready, that we're not equipped, that we cannot make a difference. You know, we need to start making that difference right now. And, so, and then also over my years of experience, you know, I have seen poverty. I have seen, you know, poor health. I have seen everything firsthand. Most of my career has been across West Africa. Yeah, and I have seen people who do not, when they say the definition of poverty is a dollar a day, people that live on less than a dollar a day. I have seen people who earn less than $30 a month. And I'm sure people who live in Africa can really resonate with that. And most of, more often than not, these people have huge families, you know, a man with two wives and 10 children earning $20 a month. How in the world is he expected to survive? But on the other hand, Africa has so many things that can help these people skyrocket out of poverty. Is it the natural resources? Is it the good weather? All the things that we require. So it just means there's a gap. How can we bridge this gap? And so for me, I think it is absolutely important for us to all work together to be able to identify this young generation of young people and help them break the cycle of poverty. If we want to achieve the SDGs by 2030, where they say it's a continent or a world with no poverty, access to good education, access to good health, you know, life below water and everything, it takes serious collaboration. And it starts, the change starts with one person. You know, more often than not, I hear people say, no, what can I do as an individual? There's nothing I can do. I cannot make a difference. And that's a wrong mindset, trying to change that mindset that if you start to do something in your community, 
that thing can skyrocket and then other people can start to follow suit and then and emulate you. And that's one thing. And then also I was asked, uh, what advice do I have for the over 550 fellows that are working in, I'm trying to address the 17 SDGs. So for me, I'll say the two most powerful forms of capital on earth, yeah, are ideas and opportunity. Ideas that can generate wealth or leverage resources and relationships that can, that can be leveraged upon to create opportunities for you. So I have some mentors, and one thing that they always say is that you should never, ever, ever underestimate the ideas of the, the importance of ideas and relationships, particularly relationships. But I'll start with an idea. I'll start with the first one, which ideas. So you see, there's several businesses today that people have started and are successful in, but these people didn't have the capital to start the businesses on their own or to scale it up. Most of them either had an idea that they could trade up or relationships that they could leverage upon to access opportunities or even capital. So for you young fellows, it is extremely important that you start to build a track record in the little things that you do in your own small community. It could be in your little community, in your school, in your country, whatever it is. And this, this may include things like, you know, the time you used to build a skill set or years of, work, years of work or experience in a particular field or whatever it is. But in whatever you do, identify what you're good at what you enjoy doing, and start to build a track record. In building a track record, you'll come across ideas, ideas that are scalable and sellable. And for you, you're extremely lucky and privileged to be Millennium Fellows, because one of the most amazing things is the rich network of people that make up the fellowship. So start to mix with your peers, start to interact with them, and most importantly, stay in touch. Don't let it just be something that just comes and goes. You really need to stay in touch. You just never know. The person who you're just chatting with today, tomorrow could become the president of his or her country or just be in a position of authority where they could use your skills. So it's important that you stay in touch and maintain those relationships. And then also I was asked uh, how to talk about how you know, I, my journey started and how I ended up in uh, United Nations in New York. You know, so I have some, I've identified certain pointers I'd like to share with you as I share my story here. All my friends who have known me from when I was much younger here yeah, have known that I always had a dream. And that dream had always been to work in the United Nations. And it may sound fickle, but when I, the first time I heard about the United Nations is through my uncle, who was working in the UN. I was probably, what, 10 or, or 11 at that, at that time. And then whenever he visited Nigeria from New York, he will come with a massive SUV, with United Nations written all over it. And it looked so cool. And I'm like, you know what? I want to work where this guy works. And then as I grew older, I started to find out what he was doing and what the United Nations was about. And basically, he broke it down to me in a very simple way. That the world is made up of people who are rich and who are poor. But the poor people are a lot more than the rich people. And so what they basically do is try to broker peace and help the poor people live a better life. And as a child, that was the easiest and simplest way to just explain what the UN was all about. And I'm like, you know what? I want to be part of this big thing. But how was I going to get there? I didn't know. But I was just like, okay, I was going to do the requirements. So he, was, he served as a big mentor in my life in terms of things like, oh, what course shall I study? So I went to university everybody as well. So I'm saluting my University of Ibadan fellows right now. And I studied sociology in Ibadan. And I did that for four years. And I went to, then I moved on to the UK. I went to University of Bristol. And I studied public policy. Because I realized that, you know, the first most important thing is to have the educational background. Then you're sellable. As I was doing those things, I started to volunteer in various places. I volunteered in Oxfam for certain NGOs in Nigeria and in the UK. And by the time I finished, I was looking to work in an organization that was not just talking the talk, but that was walking the talk. And I was very fortunate, you know, and it's, it's all about going back to relationships. You know, the, the, I had a family friend who I'd always been in touch with and who told me there was an organization called Sahara Group that was recruiting. And then he was happy to submit my CV for me. But he looked at it and saw that, you know, it was up to standard. And that's why, that's a problem that we have. People are looking for others to help them, but you don't want to do your own part of the work. You need to do your own part of the work first before somebody else will be willing to help you. 
And so he submitted my CV for me in, in Sahara Group. And I got in and did, went through the interview process, told them what I wanted to do. And, and the one thing they kept on saying was they could see the passion. And so I was thrown into the deep end to set up the corporate social responsibility departments. I was fresh out of my master's. I was probably, what, 26, 27 at that time. And I was told to build the department from the scratch. But because I had the vision and I knew what I wanted, it was hard because I had to learn from others. I had to go for training. I had to do a lot of self-learning and whatnot. But ultimately, it went well. And, you know, 14, 15 years later, I can look back and smile. So what I'll say to people is, you know, you must always have a vision. And a major problem that we have is that we have small visions and small dreams. There's something that I always say to people, if your dream is not big enough that it scares you, then it's not a dream at all. If you tell someone your dream and the person says, oh, okay, yeah, that's cool, I can relate to it, then that's not a dream. That's why it's called a dream. A dream is something that when you tell people, it should scare them, they should be like, dude, you're crazy. That's not achievable. You have to set high standards and high goals for yourself. Then you, you must also believe in yourself because people will always try to put you down. If you don't believe in yourself, you will not succeed. You must, be able to, you must believe that you can conquer the world and that, with, that nothing is impossible. You know, uh, prior coming to this, I kept saying that I, I was, always worked in Sahara. And one thing about Sahara Group is that Sahara's motto is impossible is nothing. You are pumped to believe that impossible is nothing. It might not sound like correct English, but that's what's in your head. And it means that nothing is impossible. You can do any and everything. And if you believe in it, you will do it. So when you're given a task that appears to be, you know, out of this world, all you need to just sit down and think through and you find a way to do it. Another thing I need to say is that integrity is key because if people don't know who you are, yeah, and if you can, people can't stand up for you, then you're a failure. So they must be able to ask at least 10 different people the same question about you and the answer must be relatively consistent. They must be able to say, oh, this guy or this girl is hardworking, or this person is dedicated. And it all boils down to, it goes back to building a track record for yourself. And these were the things that I, I tried to work with while I was working in Sahara. You know, integrity, to be dedicated, to be committed. And because most people look at young people, particularly a young guy, you just think, oh, you're ambitious, you know, you might want to steal money, you might not be trustworthy and whatnot. You have to break all those stereotypes. You have to intentionally break all those stereotypes. In terms of skill set as well, what, what skill sets do you have? You know, everyone has skills that are unique to them. You need to identify your skills and work on them. Know what you're good at and don't try to run another person's race. And the mistake that we have is people try to copy other people. When I joined Sahara, I joined with a couple of, of people who were about 10 of us that got hired on the same day. And most of the other guys who were working in, they were traders, they were oil traders, they were in finance, they were in other things. At that time, believe me, going into an oil company and working in CSR, corporate social responsibility in the foundation, wasn't cool. It didn't look cool. A lot of people were saying to me, why would you go and do that? Why can't you go elsewhere, go to another department and whatnot? But I knew what I wanted. And I said, I'm going to focus on this. And I was determined to make a difference. And I did. And over my years there, I built the department and it metamorphosized into a foundation with a lot of people operating not just in Nigeria. We started operating in all the countries that the company operated. So from Nigeria to Ghana to Cote d'Ivoire to Tanzania to Kenya to Zimbabwe to, to Geneva to the, to the Middle East, everywhere. And right now, it's running on its own. In fact, I have one of my, the person who took over for me, I believe he's on this call as well, and he's running it perfectly. So it's about having a dream and running with it. And then never be afraid of challenges. I was never afraid of challenges, and I had to learn that very fast because I was reported straight to the, one of the owners of the company. And he didn't have time for, for anything. He would just throw me into the deep end and tell me to go and sort it out, tell you to figure it out. It will give you training that you require, but you also had to use your own intuition and get things done. And so you never let things like age or race or gender or level of education or anything be a barrier to your success. You know, I've, I've faced various challenges trying to build, you know, my career and the department and Sahara Foundation ultimately, yeah. Most importantly was 
the gender and the age issue. Imagine being a young black Nigerian from an industry, oil and gas industry that is seen as corrupt. You know, I had to fight the perception and show people that I'm different and I'm diligent. But ultimately, you paid off. And then you also have to let excellence be your watchword. You know, just strive for global excellence. Most times people know, so to the, and I'm not trying to, you know, run down Nigerians or anything, but most of the people here, I'm sure you know that when you hear someone is from Nigeria, the first thing that comes to people's mind is that, oh my God, I'm sure it's one of these scammers, email scammers or internet fraudsters. And people have asked me that severally, but you have to change that perception and let them know that I'm different. You know, everybody will say they're different, but you have to prove it. And then people will start to see that you're actually different. And they don't be scared to make mistakes. Mistakes are bound to happen. But you make sure you learn from your mistakes so you don't repeat them. And also learn from other people's mistakes as well. And then you also need to understand that there are stages and there are steps. Most people don't want to grow in stages. You know, it's not a dash, it's not a marathon. It takes time. Enjoy each stage. Because it's like building a house. There's a foundation, and then you lay the blocks, and there's roofing and whatnot. So we need to learn to enjoy each stage. People want to get out of school today and become a manager tomorrow. It doesn't work that way. Yeah, you can get a job if your dad knows people. You can become a manager, but you will fail. All these experiences really do matter. And I made sure that, you know, I learned from all the experiences. And then my final point goes back to everything they have said and what I started with relationships. So I was being diligent in what I was doing working in Sahara. And uh, when the SDGs were launched in 2015, the United Nations was looking for a private sector company to partner with, to showcase private sector and public sector partnerships towards achieving the SDGs. And so they looked through a list of 100 companies and identified 13 companies in the world who the SDG fund could partner with. And guess what? Sahara was one of those companies. And so I just got a call from my director one day saying, hey, um, we've been identified to partner with the UN to do X, Y, Z, to showcase the SDGs and whatnot. So this is going to fall on your table. And I was like, okay, okay, this is a good task, a different challenge. I was happy to do it. And started doing it, started running with it. Someone from the SDG fund, the director of the fund, came to Nigeria twice for meetings and whatnot. And the second time she came to Nigeria, she called me aside and said, um, you know, I've been speaking to your director about something in the SDG fund. We've been trying to recruit someone of African descent who understands the African markets and the African, you know, the sector to be able to help us promote partnerships between the United Nations and private sector in Africa. But we found it very difficult to get someone that fits that match. But then from talking to you and working with you, I think you're the perfect person for that. I'm just thinking what you're all about. I'm here doing my work. And she just told me to submit my CV and, you know, apply with other people. And I did. And I just, you know, went, went with the flow. At the end of the day, I got an email saying, hey, you know, you scaled through this process and you've been given the job. And that's how I ended up moving from Sahara Group in the private sector in Nigeria to working with the United Nations here in New York. And over the last almost two years that I've been here, I know the number of people that I have met number of places I have been to and the kind of impact that we're having as the SDG Fund, as UNDP, and as UN and Global in general. And to make matters better, we're still, we're still partnering with the Sahara Group in Nigeria. So for me, it's a win-win situation. We're still seen as the Sahara staff working with the United Nations. What, what else can I ask for? So ultimately, it all boils down to, you know, being dedicated to what you do, committed to what you do, developing your own skill sets, and building relationships that matter. You know, in the last year and a half that I, that's, you know, I've been very active in all the things I've been doing here, I realized that a lot of the relationships that I had developed over the last 10 years have really come, come in handy in all the countries where we had operated, be it Ghana, Tanzania, Zambia, in every place that we've operated. And so you don't just overlook anyone, think, oh, this is a driver today or this is someone little tomorrow. You just never know how or where they will come in handy. So as I've said earlier, relationships are key. Dedication is key. Commitment is key. You know, and just ensure that you build a track record. I hope I haven't gone over my time. I think I, I have just a little bit. Where are moderators? Are they there? Yeah.
Yeah, yeah we're, we're here. here. Okay. Okay, so um, so there are a few questions for you. Okay. Are you, are you ready for the questions? Yes, I am. Okay, so the first question is, um, what, what is the best part of your job? What is the best part of what you do? The best part of what I do? The best, yeah. to me, the best part of what I do is the instant impact, you know, that I can see on the lives of, of, of our, like Jesus would quite loosely, our beneficiaries. So in a place where you have so many people that are deprived, you know, doing simple projects, having simple partnerships. And that's what the SDGs are about. You know, it's not about charity or anything. It's about identifying solutions to global problems in a sustainable way. So I say to people, you can be an entrepreneur, yeah, and just align with the SDGs. Guess what? You'll be making money and at the same time having real positive social impact on the community or in the society or whatever it is. So for me, it's the, the best part of my job is the impact, the instant impact that we have on the lives of the beneficiaries. Any other question? Yes, there is. Um, another question is, uh, you've actually highlighted a lot of things the other time, but what are the challenges of the job? Like, the major challenges that you face along the way? So it's people's perception of you. It's overcoming the perception that people have. There's, we have, even as human beings, as we are, as you are, we all have stereotypes of other people. So you see somebody, and because of who they are, where they're from, their background, the, type, the sound of their name, their gender, their race, we just assume there's something about them. So it's about overcoming those barriers. I went to India recently, and I met a young man, and he walked up to me after my speech, and he said to me, he said, I'm, I need to apologize to all Nigerians. He said, I have never met a Nigerian face-to-face. -face. I have never met one in person. Yeah but I had always assumed that all Nigerians were fraudsters. But as when I saw that you were a keynote speaker, you know, I had blanked out, but he just came all the same. And then listening to me had changed his perception. That's just a typical example. So you walk into a place for a meeting, and once they see you, people just switch off. So you immediately have to be able to create an impression. Create something that would change that impression so that people will even want to listen to you, because if not, people don't even want to hear what you have to say. So the, one of the greatest challenges is to be able to change the impression that people have of young people, of people of whatever descent you are, be it African, be it Asian, whatever it is, of your sex and whatever it is, but just about change, overcoming the barriers that people have. All right, so next um, question is from, next question is from um, Seraph from TKM College of Engineering, India. Okay, so she's saying, please do mention how to work with UN in the future for fellows like us. So how she wants to know how, you know, how she can get to work with UN. So the there's, there's something called UN Volunteers, right? I don't know if you heard of it. That's an easy way. Not easy. That's an easier way to get in. So there, and it's operational in every country. So just look for the UN Volunteers Organization in your country and your region and apply to volunteer. It's, it's for free, obviously, because it's voluntary and whatnot. But you get to meet people. You get to show your skills. You get to, deliver, to start to develop those skills that are required. Yeah? And when opportunities come up, you'll be the first point of call. And then also start to intentionally attend forums or events where you can meet people that work in the UN. Because more often than not, as I said, it's usually referrals. If you're looking for someone to work with, you want someone to refer people who are competent to you. So at the end of the day, if you start to develop relationships with people that matter, people that work in the UN, or people that know people that work in the UN, when opportunities come up as well, you can be referred. So the easiest way, an easier way to start is to join UN volunteers. Okay, all right. So um, the next question is coming from Justin Spiel, um speak from Josephine and Rollins College, Winter Park, Florida, USA. She wants to know how your volunteer work and your choices during university influenced your choice to work with CSR instead of some other social impact parts. So how did your you know, university experience influence the CSR? Why? How did you decide to work with CSR? 
Okay, so yeah, and I get a question. So wh while I was in uni, I was a bit confused about what, you know, whether to go with the public sector or the private sector, through CSR or through an NGO or whatever it is. But in Nigeria, where I was at that point in time, I realized that most of the NGOs at that point were struggling. They didn't have the funding. And so, you know, looking for funding is one thing. And if you have to, and then being able to implement the projects is another thing. Most of them spend their time looking for money and not being able to do what they wanted to do. So I realized quickly that it was the private sector companies who were committed to giving back. Yeah, that was, that was the best place to work because they have the funding, but they're just looking for people to help them spend the money in the right way. So I decided to save myself the stress of working with NGOs who, who are struggling for funding. And, but then to go into a private sector who had the money, but then help them spend the money in a sustainable way. So that's what really influenced my decision to go into CSI with the private sector. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, another question is coming from uh, Shivang Tatsali, Northeastern University. Uh, Shivang Tatsali said, uh, how can we leverage the incredible network of global fellows to foster collaboration in our own communities? Uh, she, uh, the question is, how can we leverage the incredible network of global fellows to foster collaboration in our own communities? Yeah, so as, as I said, yeah, the first thing you need to do is always network with people and meet people. You know, through this fellowship you are, that you're in, yeah, you will meet people from various backgrounds, you know, whether it be social economic background, financial background, educational background, or whatever it is. Most times, the problem we have most of the time is we only want to be, pe be with people like us and associate with people like us, whether it's someone from the same gender or race or someone in our class or someone in our neighborhood. And most, most often, more often than not, these people think like us. They are like us. You know, they reason like us. They share the same ideas with us. And if you're always hanging out or interacting with those people, uh, there's so far you can go. So the best thing I can say to you is make sure you interact with other pe as many people as possible within your network, within the fellowship. Try to know people. Get to understand them. People that don't even agree with you. Those are the best kind of people to talk to. Because at the end of the day, you end up exchanging ideas, understanding the other person's point of view, and then when opportunities come up, you're in a better position. You know, so my advice is, make sure you try to know as many people as possible within your network, you know, and interact with them and let them know who you are and what you're good at. Once people know you for something, there will always be a point in time when people are looking for someone with a particular skill, your name will always pop up and they will always come back to you. Okay. All right. Um, Ayedila Avoka, Ashesh University. How can I scale the impact of my campus social venture? while in school? How can I scale the impact of my work while in school? So, you know, the, most, the easiest way is to leverage on technology. Right now, the thing is, people, a lot of people are doing stuff, yeah? But no one sees what they're doing. So it's like a guy is going to, you're trying to talk to a girl and you're, using, you're winking at a girl in the dark. No one sees what you're doing. She can't see what you're doing. You wink from now till next year. She wouldn't even know that you're winking at her. So the same way you're doing good things, in your little community, no matter how little it is here, if you're not able to showcase it to people, the only way people will be willing to help you scale up by investing their time, their energy, their resources, be it financial resources or capital resources, is by them seeing what you're doing. You'll be able to demonstrate value. So take advantage of you know, technology. Show what you're doing on important platforms. If you think you have a good network of people on Facebook or is, I mean, one that me I particularly like is LinkedIn because there are a lot of professionals there. Show what you're doing on such relevant platforms. And I use the word relevant very carefully, you know, relevant platforms where people, like-minded people can see what you're doing and they will support you. Believe me, I know so many people out there who are looking for initiatives to support. But the problem is they can't find any credible ones. And there are a lot of people who have credible initiatives but can't find support, be it financial or whatever it is. So it's about bridging that gap. So look for those platforms where you can share some of these things. I can give you a very good example. I'm not trying to sell anybody's market, but there's a Sahara Hub where you, Sahara Group where I work here. Yeah? There's a Sahara Hub. So just Google Sahara Group in Nigeria and check the hub. What they're trying to do, the whole essence of the hub is to promote entrepreneurship. 
is identifying young people with good business ideas that offer solutions to social problems and they match them with a rich network of people who will support them. So look at such platforms and share your ideas and you'll be surprised how you'll be able to you know, scale it up. Um, another question is coming from Michael Gallo from Moravia College, United States of America. Mm -hmm. He said, uh, how do you hold corporations uh, slash NGOs accountable for all of their social impact, whether positive or the other way around in developing countries and prevent them from doing more harm than good? Okay, yeah, that's a, that's a very good question. And so I'll use a very typical example of something that we're doing in Nigeria that we had started here at the global level. And I'm Nigerian, hey, so charity begins at home. So we decided to try it out in Nigeria first. And we realized that a lot of private sector organizations and NGOs are doing things, be it good or bad or just at face value. And so to be able to show and identify, to, to, to sieve out those who are doing good from those who are not really doing so much, we decided to set up what we call the private sector advisory group. And one of the objectives of that private sector advisory group is to bring companies together, you know, and identify them and put them to different clusters so that people that are doing similar things can work together. But another thing that we have done, and one thing that we realized is that people don't report what they're doing. Yeah. So we've developed a reporting platform where people can report their activities and then this can be verified by other parties. So what is extremely critical here is third party verification. So if I come and claim that I have an NGO, a private sector company, and I'm doing ABC, and I'm shouting about it, there will be other people who can tell, who know me, and can say, oh, this, this guy isn't doing this thing. He isn't doing it. And so through partnerships with the UN, UN Global Compact, the SDG Fund, and whatnot, we've set up mechanisms in place where people can report and report what they're doing to showcase what they're doing. And other people can then verify to see if they're actually doing these things, if these things are meeting the goals that they were set, or if people are actually doing harm. And this way, by communicating and showcasing what people are doing and calling out people that are not doing what they claim that they're doing, we believe that's a starting point to be able to guide people. Because you know if I'm going to lie about what I'm doing, there's someone out there who will know and who can report me. And I'll be, and I'll be you know, called out and blacklisted. So it's about communicating and showcasing what you're doing and getting people to monitor and verify. Okay. Um, another question is, is from uh, Davasi K. Joseph, TKM College of Engineering in India. Mm -hmm. uh, TKM, uh, was, uh, Davasi said, something I've noticed is that people are very active and follow the events in the political arena, mostly because the ideologies connect to people's emotions. How can we leverage that kind of network, networking and citizens' participation to promote SDGs in our communities? Okay, so, and that, that's very right. Because, but the, and the, the good thing about that is that there's an opportunity to leverage on something. People like to take advantage of emotions. People are very emotional. So once you're able to at least catch people based on that, that's a starting point. You've captured their attention. But then the next thing is to show people, and, I, and I'm trying to be very careful about what I say here, but what is the need for them? You know, and when I say it, I'm not saying people should be jealous or anything about it or should be selfish about it. But if people understand that by contributing towards the SDGs, yes, they're not only making life better for themselves, it's affecting the communities in which they live. You know, so people have to understand that you have to let show people that whatever activities they engage in can be of benefit to them, be it financially or, or otherwise, to their families and to their communities. And it, it ranges across different levels. So from young children to adults, we all will reap the consequences of our actions. And so if people start to look at the global, the social problems that exist, so be it you know, poverty or, or, or climate change, that's one that is common across board and everything. Let me, don't let me use reduce poverty a lot, a, lot, a lot now. If people start to look at climate change as a big issue and understand the effects of their actions, yeah, people will start to take actions to mitigate all these things. And then alongside, people start to see that there are opportunities to make money from this thing. So it's a win-win situation. You, you understand that you can make money from this thing, but at the same time, you're helping to develop your community. So to answer the question is to show people the value 
that there is beyond emotions. Emotions are good and it helps people to get attention. But to take it from emotions to productive actions, people need to see the value in whatever action you're telling them to take. Mm. All right, so uh, another question here is coming from Zakia, um, College of Engineering, India, TKM. How can students, even from primary schools, uh, do something about every SDGs? Uh, so, th and that's, that's the best time to start to catch people, you know, from that very early age, for them to understand. And I have, I use myself as an example. I have two young kids, four and five years old, two boys, and I start train them from this age to let them understand things as little as like how their actions can affect other people so for instance in terms of no poverty you know how children can be when they have too many options you say you want to eat this and i give it to you and then you tell me you don't want it anymore you want to waste it you can't waste food there are a lot of children out there who have no food to eat you can eat five times a day there are children who eat once in three days so i will let you know that you cannot waste food and then when you get to like children, I use another, another example for younger children in school. So in, in, in particular in Africa, it's a common phenomenon of drinking water from plastic bags, nylon bags, what we call pure water. Yeah. And I say if you're in a school where there are a thousand children, yeah, and everyone is drinking pure one, one sachet of pure water a day, that's a thousand people, a thousand plastic bags of water after you finish drinking it. If one person decides to throw his plastic bag in the drainage, it might not make so much of a difference because it's just one bag in the drainage. But imagine if everyone decided to throw the plastic bags in the drainage and they do that every day for a week. That's a thousand plastic bags in the drainage per day for five days. That's five. What happens? When it rains, what happens? There's flood. So even at that young age, what we start try to do is let young children know that there are little things that they can do that can affect the SDGs. So stop littering the ground. Stop throwing plastic bags in the drainage. Stop wasting food. If you have excess food that you take to school and you can't finish your food, there might be another child in your class who is hungry, whose parents didn't even give them any food to take to school. Share your snack with them so they can eat because the attention span of children are very short. Now imagine a hungry child. The child will go to school and not learn anything now. So if your child has extra food, then you can, you can share with his friend or, or somebody else. If a child is ill, in school another child has you know access to medical care i can tell his parents or i have a friend there's just little little things that the children can do we need to start to let them understand these things from young age so as they grow older they'll realize the importance of these things and they'll be able to do more you know in many parts of the world you see young people developing apps developing solutions to most of these problems from the ages of 12, 13, 14, 15 i was in india recently and seeing what young indians are doing with technology it's amazing. So let's not think that anyone is too young to be able to contribute towards the SDGs. Thank you very much. Uh, here is another question. This question is from uh, Feruz Sahana Nufakuya from TKM College of Engineering, India. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, Feruz said, how to direct general people towards the SDGs or even make an interest in it as they have been doing everything differently to date because of the traditions that exist or they continue with the same methods that we are taught of. Okay, sorry. Let me like rephrase the question again. It says, how can, uh, how can we involve other members of our campus in SDGs? Uh, that is, how can we convince other young people that these issues are important and get them get involved? That is from Rollins, Rollins from College, Florida, USA. Okay, so the good thing is, because you're all in the same space and in the same school, you know people's likes and their areas and whatnot. The first thing you should do is do something that works. You know, develop a small solution that has tangible impacts. So it could be going to support a food bank, you know, or it could be going to give hungry children food to eat and let people see the impact of how just a little meal can change the life of someone. What people like to see is practical results because when I go and tell someone to come and join me in doing something, the first thing they will ask is, have you done it? And if I say, yes, has it worked? Yes, then show me, show me evidence that it has worked. You know, so in our little ways, we need to communicate with people around us things that we have done. Share personal experiences. Talk about things that you have seen or that, that you have read. 
and then showcase these things within your network. You know, I, I keep saying you need to leverage the power of, of technology and the internet, you know, to be able to identify things that people have done in different places. And most of these things, there's no point trying to reinvent the wheel. If you check, you see that people are already doing most of these things in different places. So you can even just copy and paste, but to make it to adapt into your own community. And once you're able to, to show people around you some of these things that, that have been done, people will join the bandwagon. People are starting to get more and more aware of the SDGs. The MDGs were not even the Millennium Development Goals. They were not as successful as this. All throughout the existence of the lifespan of the MDGs, people didn't really know about them. But in just how many years of the SDGs, just about three years of the SDGs, the level of awareness is amazing. And then we need to move from awareness to implementation. And one important thing, that the UN, the private sector and government are doing is getting younger people involved because they know that the, the young people are the ones that can actually drive the implementation of the SDGs. So identify people within your network and, and let them know what you're doing in your little space. And I can guarantee you that people will join the bandwagon. I can't hear you. Thank you so much for your time. Yeah, I want to ask, do you have uh, any final words for the fellows before we end the meeting? What are your last thoughts? Okay, so what I'll just say is, you know, you, as I said earlier, you need to make yourself relevant in whatever you do. I cannot even emphasize that. You know, more, more often than not, people are always asking for help. Young people are always going about asking for help. But how about you saying to people who you think, you know, you're like your mentors, I, hear, I see you're working on this. Can I offer help to you on this portion for free? You know, you need to get, provide value. Get into their value chain and offer them tangible value. You will quickly become valuable and they will let you into deeper value processes. Most people who you look at as mentors are extremely busy and they have so many things they're working on. And more often than not, they're looking for people to support them. But then the question they're used to having to, to receiving most time is, oh, please, can you give me a job? Oh, please, can you help me with this? Can you give me some money? If you walk up to someone and say, oh, I, you know, I've read about you and I see that you're working on this and I have some skills in this and I'm willing to help you, that will take the person you know, by surprise. And the person will start to look at you differently. And then once you can start to enter such circles and start to provide, offer value and start to get known for the value that you're adding, you'll become relevant. And ultimately, you become an expert. And who is an expert? An expert is someone who keeps doing the same thing over and over again until it becomes part of him or her. And then you, become, you build a name for yourself and you become relevant in the world. So my advice to you is just be consistent. There will be challenges. There will be obstacles. There will be hiccups. But don't let all of that affect you. Because if you just give up after a small problem, then you're not persistent. You're not a warrior, you're not a fighter, you need to fight. You know, I, I like to use uh, sports as an example because most people like sports. What we see on the field, if it's soccer or in a boxing match or whatever it is, it's just the tip of the iceberg. Most times the people on the pitch or whatever it is would have been preparing so much before that day. And then they just come and show. So more often than people just see a star. You see who's in boats come and just run 10 seconds and you say he's a star. But you don't know how much work he has put into it. So we need to be ready to put, the, put in the work. Put in the work and ultimately it will pay. Sam is a good example. You know, the partnership b between MC and United, United Nations uh, Economic Impact, it's a classical example. He's put in so much work into this. To be able to gather all of you from the various countries of the world together is not a joke. So put in the work and I can guarantee you that if you're consistent, it will definitely pay off. All right. Thank you so much, Tomiwa, for uh, this wonderful session. Thank you so much, Millennium Fellows, for turning up. Uh, we have to bring the meeting to a close right about now. Uh, Tomiwa, please, we'd like to get your contact So it, well, in terms of my email or, hello? Hello? Hi, Timua. Oh, hi. Noha here. I think hi, that man. the line has dropped with oh, okay. uh, Anatoja and Obeya, okay. but I want to thank them for moderating if they don't join back in a few seconds. And thank you for joining and sharing your 
um, lessons learned and your career path and how you got here and all the valuable advice. And um, yes, we would love to know if there's any way that Millennium Fellows can be in contact with you, um, whether that's social media or email, whichever you prefer. Um, I, I know there are a lot of other questions that people have asked in the chat box that they might want to follow okay, up yeah, on. Interesting. Okay, so what I can do is I, I can, do you want to put it in the chat box or should I sure. send it to you? Okay, so I've, yeah. So I've sent, uh, I can either through my email or via LinkedIn. Great, thank you. And so thank you so much for your time and thank you to all the fellows who joined us today. Uh, hopefully we'll see you in an upcoming session. Um, everybody is thanking you, Tamiwa, for an amazing session. So we really very much appreciate you taking the time. Oh, you're welcome. It was a pleasure and I really enjoyed it and I look forward to being in touch with everyone as well. All right. Thank you all. Have a great day. Yeah, you're welcome. Take care.